intent process. Um, I'm glad you missed the majority of my, <laughs> my presentation so far. Um, uh, so they developed a notice intent process and, and basically um, came up with a very defined um, method for establishing a mitigation fund for projects. So you, you basically, um, you have a calculator you can use as a developer, you, you know going into it, okay, um, I'm on a site, I can look at a map and see these are the different gradients of soil classifications I have on the site. You know, these, these soils don't matter to the state, these do, and, and if they do, they're factored into this calculator, I plug in my project, I get an output, and I know I'm going to put X amount of dollars into this mitigation fund going into my project, which um, will be used by the department in whatever you know, way they've developed um, to ascribe those funds to then, you know, theoretically uh, uh, create or incentivize agricultural use elsewhere. Um, so, you know, there's, there's no, I think, you know, one of the takeaways I think is clear from, from all these markets is there's no silver bullet here. There's no clear uh, one solution that will, will work in all cases, um, but, but clarity is, is big, right? So um, being able to clearly understand how to work, uh, collaborate with your landowner, collaborate with your regulators, the, 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 you know, the jurisdictions that are gonna be permitting the project to get the project approved, as long as everyone's clear on the impacts of the project and how it moves forward. Um, so I, I think, you know, the takeaway from there is clarity, um, and, and there's not really a, you know, there's, there's not really a, you can't do this here type of mentality. There's, if you want to do this here, this is what you're going to have to do to do it, uh, and move forward in that way. Um, in the Midwest, so we, we have projects on the ground in Minnesota and Illinois, and Minnesota was really I think the pioneer in terms of developing a uh, pollinator scorecard that has kind of picked up steam and, and you see that in various states across um, in various states of development uh, to be clear across multiple markets um, but but Minnesota was definitely the, uh, the leader there um, and it's mandatory in Minnesota to uh, submit a scorecard and have a passing scorecard grade to be able to develop a solar project um, in that market. Illinois uh, has a scorecard, it's not mandatory at the state level uh, as opposed to Minnesota, um, but certain um, uh, permitting authorities will bring that in and require it at their own discretion for a project to move forward. Um, so, you know, and, and I think certainly on a one-off basis um, out in the Midwest, obviously agriculture is huge, um, so on a one-off basis, there's concerns about um, the co-location of agriculture and, and solar, um, and that, that really gets dealt with on a project-by-project -project basis. It's on, the onus is on the developer to bring forward um, sort of a very um, clear and transparent process. Um, I'm working with this landowner. They do this type of farming activity on the property. Through collaboration, we have determined that this location on the property is an ideal place for the project. Um, you know, even, even doing something like an alternatives analysis to prove why we settled on this location, looking at the ways that that farming operation might use all of their property and why, why were these acres targeted by both the developer and the landowner as a suitable place to locate that and to present that in a consolidated way to the uh, to the permitting authority so that they can understand the process that was gone through already organically with that developer and that landowner to get to that outcome. Um, jumping over to the West Coast, I, I, I was talking to our West Coast team a little bit about this. So California um, is, is a tricky market. Um, the, they have um, an act that's been in place for a long time called the Williamson Act, which basically um, was a way for uh, farmers to uh, be able to uh, receive uh, special taxation treatment, um, given the, the high cost of real estate in that market, uh, protect their ability to have a stable um, operational cost for their farms. Um, and when you, when you look at doing a solar project there, the reality is um, to move forward with a project on a Williamson Act property, 
it has to be removed from the Williamson Act. And it's prohibitive to do so because the costs to do so are extreme. So basically that's a non-starter. The interesting thing that is developing now, um, you know, thinking about all the stuff I was seeing as I was driving my way up here, all the, all the climate change impacts in there, you know, as we all know, it's drought, right? So farmers are being uh, basically left with no other option than to um, let fallow uh, a large portion of their farmland because of drought conditions. And what are they going to do? Um, and their hands are tied due to this Williamson Act restriction. So there's activity afoot now to address this and say, look, we, we have to deal with this and make this not a non-starter, um, but have this be uh, amended to have a pathway forward because these farmers need diversity if they're going to survive because they can't operate the way they have been. Um, and, and it's nothing that anyone can control. So we have to react to that and do something about it. So uh, it'll be really interesting to see what happens in California as that gains steam, but a real recognition there that um, there, are, there are drivers and forces that you know, the solar industry, the agricultural industry can't control. And there needs to be a way to react to that in real time as it happens, um, because we're all facing things now that you know, we may have never dreamed we would have to face uh, in decades prior. Um, I think you know, those are really the, the highlights I wanted to hit, make sure we had time to hit. I do have um, some experience from other markets as well down in the Southeast, um, talking to our team down there. We, we haven't really seen a lot um, of land use concerns down there. I mean, there's, there's tons of land, um, it's wide open. Um, and there's, there's certainly a, a different set of inputs that go into the Southeastern markets. Um, and so that really hasn't, hasn't come to the forefront yet down there. Um, I would say just you know, based on my own experience, as I mentioned, we have a long track record of working with agricultural landowners. I went back through all the projects we've worked on. I can't remember a time where we did a project where the solar project was taking the place of uh, food production, right? So um, when we talk about siting solar projects on agricultural land, um, historically for Nexam, that has meant, you know, for instance, that that first large scale ground mounted project I worked on in Massachusetts, it meant of the 200 acres that farmer said, hey, you know, here's 15 acres that are very sandy soil. Um, the, you know, the, the topsoil is not great production yield out of that area has never been good. Um, so you go off in that corner and do the solar project, we'll keep doing what we do best, and what we actually generate revenue from uh, in these other areas of our property. And then you know, we can work together to make this a win for everybody. So um, that has always kind of been the evolutionary process on a site by site basis. But of course it's hard to, to know for certain that that will be the way that every solar project that gets done in agricultural land gets considered. Um, we, and, you know, I think Nexamp puts a lot of focus on, I think what this group would call uh, co-location projects. So not dual use projects as defined, but co-location projects. We have a, a number of years now, we've been working with the American Solar Grazing Association um, on siting grazing animals on our projects. Um, we've done, uh, we started in New York with them, did a, a whole a host of projects as a pilot program with them out there. And we've since expanded that and we're basically expanding it as rapidly as we reasonably can working with uh, shepherds and their flocks who are in the areas where we're um, developing projects uh, and doing it in a thoughtful way to make sure it's working. Um, it's you know, safe for the grazing animals, safe for everyone involved. Um, but um, doing that now in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, we'll certainly be looking to um, deploy those on our, our main projects as we get those underway. I know grazing animals is a point of discussion that this group has addressed as well. And you know, how do you make sure that the, the regulators are considering that and, and trying to promote that to the extent that you can, um, given its, its broad benefits um, as a co-location solution. Um, we're proactively installing pollinator habitat, habitat, even when it's not required. We typically try to set aside a portion of the, the solar area um, to just install pollinator habitat as a best practice. 
um, and certifying habitat through organizations like the National Wildlife Federation so that we um, have a third party you know, looking at what we're doing and, and verifying that there is habitat for um, ecological diversity to be introduced to the site. Um, habitat to um, for various species to take foothold and, and grow and have nesting habitat and so forth. Um, and very simple things like, you know, as a best practice, we just we try to always install a farm fence where we can. So a wooden post, knotted wire fence versus the traditional chain link, small stuff, but it just um, for us, it, it just it's the right thing to do. Um, and I think it has a it's a small thing that can have a dramatic impact on the look and feel of a project from less of a sort of industrial type uh, use to an agricultural use, but it also has practical benefits um, like the ability for you know, various animals to flow through that type of fencing um, as opposed to a chain link fence. So um, those are all things that we just were working on actively over time, trying to get better at every day. And even if you know, there isn't a permitting authority that requires it, we're just trying to install it anyway. Um, I'll pause there. Um, I think I've probably taken up my time, but um, as I said, I've, we've got experience in other markets and I'm happy to answer questions if anyone has some from, from other markets, but those were really the, the big ones that I could think of as I was trying to think about this topic. Great, thank you so much, um, Palmer. Um, super helpful. Let me take Nancy and then Ellen. Good morning, Palmer. Thanks for being here. Um, I wondered if you could expand upon your, your brief comments on the mitigation fund in New York, whether in your experience you see that as something that um, is somewhat perfunctory um, in, in cost of doing business, or is it having an impact that there are alterations made or changes uh, to the proposal um, due to the, the mitigation that would result with the original planning? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, it's, I, I frankly uh, do not know what the objectives are for the Department of Ag and Markets in terms of that mitigation fund. So um, I can dig in with our New York team and better understand that and report back to this group if that's helpful. Um, but as in terms of, you know, the actual site where that mitigation fund is being triggered, um, in, in addition to the, the, basically the contribution to that fund, there is no other activity happening uh, in the context of that development um, that changes the way that project is brought forward for that developer, if that answers your question. So it's, you know, you, you map your project site, um, you get confirmation of the soil types that are on the project site. And I would say that goes back to that whole issue of of the need for spatial data and then the, um, the concern that even when you have it, is it right, right? So um, the ability to go in and, and actually um, inspect and confirm the existence of certain classifications of soils um, is certainly helpful. And I think you know, generally from our perspective, we would, we would welcome more due diligence, more, more diligence being put on the shoulders of the developer to confirm site conditions and confirm the existence or, or lack of existence of certain resources um, and verify that with the permitting authorities through the development process, as opposed to just going to a GIS map and saying, hey, you know, you've got prime farmland soils across 30% of your site, so here's your, here's your fund fee and you can move forward. Um, you know, as, as an example of kind of the, the errors that pop up in, in some of the data. Um, I was working on a project in Western Massachusetts and as Massachusetts refined its um, smart program, land use constraints, um, you know, I think as this group has seen, there was some, some evolution of that process. And at times um, there were the flagging of prime soils, um, soils of statewide importance and so forth. I had a site that was basically under a transmission line um, where the utility was basically, you know, going through and burning out all the vegetation. It was it was just a wasteland, um, and that site was was prime soils and soils of statewide importance. And I mean, it was there was nothing there. Um, it was sand. It was gravel. It was it was awful conditions. So, just 
you know, the ability to make sure that there's some sort of mechanism to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, the, the mapping shows this, but we're here on the ground and we're seeing this and we're, we're pulling this out of the ground. It sure doesn't look like topsoil. So you know, how do we address that and make sure we're not artificially stopping renewable energy where it would actually be a really good uh, solution for that particular site? Um, I'm, I'm going to, before I take you, Ellen, I just want to do a time check. We're a little bit over. I think this is an important conversation. Let me check with you, Palmer. Um, do you need to step off? Do you have any time to both hear Rebecca's presentation and be present for the conversation that follows? Um, what, what's your, what are your time constraints? <laughs> uh, given the mayhem I went through um, getting back home, um, my day is a mess, so I have no time constraints, so I'm, I'm happy to hang out. Okay, all right, so let me take Ellen and then I'm gonna suggest that we switch over to Rebecca, hear her presentation and by all means, Palmer, if there are questions that folks still have for you after that, that's great. And if you have comments on Rebecca's presentation, you should feel free to weigh in as well. Um, so go ahead, Ellen. <clears throat> great, thank you so much. And thank you for that overview. Um, I'll be uh, brief. My question relates sort of to Nancy's questions. Um, and I really appreciate your offer to obtain some more information. Um, Ethan provided some information which was really helpful about the mitigation requirements. Um, but one question I always have with mitigation funds, and I, I don't know if maybe we can sort of talk about that using New York as an example, or if there's information you can provide is, I understand you were just talking about it, an instance where you felt like there was a misclassification of soils, but assuming that, you know, prime soils are present in a given site, um, how that works with, like, I understand you sort of, that goes into the calculation for the amount that you would pay into this mitigation fund. But then I guess I'm, I always just have the question then, how those funds are used because I know in some places they're, they're used to conserve other parcels of farmland, for instance, but do you then have to preserve other parcels that um, have similar classifications of soils? Do you know, do you know what I'm saying? Like I, where I get confused is sort of what the actual mitigation measures are um, that you use those funds for and whether there are requirements in terms of, um, you know, if you're gonna build, you know, build a solar or install a solar project on a certain type of soil, do you then have to sort of whatever you do on another parcel have to make sure that there's sort of um, a quality there in terms of soil classification, that sort of thing. Um, right. Yeah, and I think this is um, one area where I wanna make sure I get more info from the team. Um, because I definitely have some gaps in understanding um, all the ins and outs of how that how that works. But my high level understanding is um, it's simply so the developer is contributing to that fund, which then transfers to the Department of Ag and Markets or whatever entity is going to be identified um, at the at the public level to manage that fund, and, and they then would best determine how to use that fund to either create new habitat of equivalent value elsewhere or you know, perhaps it's going to supporting the agricultural industry at large. Um, I don't know. Um, and I can certainly um, report back on, on some more details there into how that those funds are being used, assuming we have um, some clarification from the department um, for that question. Um, otherwise, I mean, I think, um, you know, certainly we've, we've got instances in other markets where we're recreating Habitat as, as a mitigation to um, taking that habitat for the for the use um, of a solar project, but typically that's been more not ag land, but um, wetland resources and other types of environments where you know you can reasonably recreate that ecological value. I think you know uh, my layman's understanding is you know for these soils to be classified as such, it's probably a result of them having been there. Um, you know, um, aggregating nutrient value for longer than we could possibly um, recreate, right, in an attempt to establish a replacement um, area that would be a full ecological value or, or agricultural value, so. 
Um, and just uh, to note the, um, the link that Ethan Winter put into the chat, um, that takes you to a two and a half page document that <clears throat> doesn't, doesn't answer your question, Ellen, but does describe how the mitigation fund, uh, mitigation calculation is determined. And in that it mentions that the fund, you know, essentially has only been in place since, if I'm, if I'm understanding this correctly, since November of last year. So there may not be a long history of what that money's been used for. Um, so why don't we pivot, um, and thank you so much for being willing to stay, um, on, on the call, Palmer, because I suspect that there may be more questions for you as well. Um, so let's turn to Rebecca and, uh, with Maine Municipal Association and you go right ahead. Thank you, Jody and Nancy and Selena and, uh, members of this really important study committee. Uh, I'm Rebecca Graham, and I'm a legislative advocate for Maine Municipal Association that covers the Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry Committee, um, where this particular stakeholder group was created. Um, I am going to provide basically a snapshot of municipal pressures, but also kind of a, a reality of municipal tax 101 uh, to try to get everyone up to speed with some of the pressures that municipalities already have uh, as a result of this development. Um, but I'm gonna start initially with some property tax basics. Um, Maine is pretty unique amongst the New England communities. Um, although I think that property tax in general is heavily relied upon for the funding of government. But in Maine, um, municipal property tax is the only sole revenue source for communities. We do not have local tax options as they do in Massachusetts and other communities. It is the sole way in which um, municipal government can leverage the revenue to uh, conduct the both mandated and desired services at the local level. And currently, uh, we are, at least in 2019, um, there's been some slight improvement because of a revenue sharing shift. So it's about 44% of the duties of government um, and the revenue that is captured that municipalities are uh, affording to government services. And income and sales tax make up the, the rest of that. The government, municipal government is mandated to spend certain amounts on public service activities like collecting revenue for the state, uh, developing comprehensive plans, enforcing building codes, shoreland zoning requirements, building roads, and of course schools. And next fiscal year, for instance, municipalities are expected to dedicate 7.2 mills of their mill rate to um, carrying out public education. Often local needs and federal mandates um, make that far greater. It's usually 50 to 60%, I think, of municipal tax um, that is spent on school delivery. So exemptions um, within the property tax system are based constitutionally, as you heard last time, on just value. So this is a very regressive approach, but it is an equal approach. So just value does mean, however, that low and fixed income individuals who own property, their value in taxation is based upon the value of that asset as it sits in the community and not necessarily their ability to pay like the other means tested taxes. Um, the only reduction for property tax income for a low income individual would be the Homestead Exemption Act, which removes 25% of their initial value, uh, $25,000 rather of their value um, from municipal tax assessment. And then the state refunds that lost revenue to that community currently at 70%. And as of this legislative session, um, they're going to amp that up with a 3% um, return to that community until it reaches a, a 100%, hopefully going forward. That allows uh, lower income individuals with lower value homes to see a reduction uh, in their property tax. And sometimes that could be all or, or most of their bill, depending upon that, that particular piece of property. Uh, the level of exempted property within any community dramatically shifts that burden onto the residential property taxpayers. Some communities such as Brunswick have a really large um, mill rate and a significant amount of property that's in the nonprofit uh, tax system. So it, it 
causes the pressure on housing, which we all know is a, is a huge problem um, and puts rents as well as uh, affordable properties for working class individuals completely out of reach in many of the, the burgeoning communities. So while constitutionally about 50% of that value is supposed to be returned to the community um, from the state because it is a state required policy, that hasn't happened, that appropriation has never um, occurred. And it's the same for government buildings that are situated in those communities. Again, uh, communities don't get that. The tree growth program is currently um, the only land program where partial value of that land that is enrolled is returned to the community from which it was lost. Both tree growth and current use don't base that evaluation on the highest and best. They value it on the current actual use. So the tree growth program uses a calculation that's based on the wood mix that's on that land. And then there's a, a complicated formula that involves the countywide assessment, as well as how much that community spends on schools that determines what that burden shift is going to be. However, there is at least some revenue that comes in. The current use isn't based on highest and best use, and there isn't necessarily that involvement at the state level um, or any sort of return to those to the property taxpayers for that lost value. Both programs lower the state valuation on the land in the community, um, and they shift that burden onto the non-classified property. However, this was something that was constitutionally enacted by Maine voters because they believed in the protection activities that these programs were meant to establish. And when they did so, they had a clear understanding, which is also protected um, in the Constitution, that there would be penalties for that landowner uh, not following their agreement for that burden that they were assuming on that local level. It's a very localized level. So to that point, um, these numbers come from the Maine Revenue Service as the total valuation of acres in the state of Maine that are in open space. Uh, and the number of acres that were withdrawn specifically in 2019 is a very small amount of acreage that was withdrawn from the program. And those are the penalties that were assessed on that piece of land, which I believe is in York County. So um, there is at least some benefit for the community that has been returned historically by uh, lands that have been withdrawn from those programs. And that's, that's essentially what the main voters approved of. So this is the, the portion of the constitution that contains those provisions, um, as well as the requirement for penalties to be enacted for the removal of that. And there are very specific um, allowable uses within the open space program and the farmlands, uh, as well as the tree growth program. The tree growth program actually has a more robust, currently under open space, it's a five year look back under tree growth, which also has a extensive um, management plan that needs to be in place and a commitment for ongoing management of those lands appropriately to maintain them, their productivity. Um, that has a 10 year look back. And it also has a significant, um, a, a significant burden shift. So we pulled this one town to show, to give you an illustration of the one program where municipalities are getting um, some value of that lost um, valuation back to their community. And we used Rumford because it has uh, quite a bit of acreage in tree growth with their mill rate and their population. So if you looked at their particular uh, mix of lands and saw that um, basically the average, the, the current valuation is between 20 and $40,000 for a parcel of undeveloped land that could be developed for another reason, including a residential property. It's um, important to know that this, that estimate doesn't factor things into that equation, like having it be on shorefront. So it's a really conservative estimate of what that impact would be. And if you looked at the full valuation of those 25,000 acres, you would be looking at uh, 698 to $1,220 an acre of full value that could be taxable for that community. The state, however, um, uses the mix of wood on that property. So we went with the middle because you're never gonna find an acre that has full um, hardwood or full softwood. There's usually a mix. So we took the middle one. Um, the state values that at $273 an acre. So the full valuation of that farmland 
is about 15 million to 31 million, where the state reduced valuation is about 7 million. And that full commitment value is a loss to that community for about 481 to um, almost a million. Whereas the state's reduced commitment and return to that community is about 215,000. So that's a significant amount of uh, value that that community is not able to leverage from larger landowners. Um, and I went with a population shift because it's really difficult to tell the number of actual residential houses in there. Um, so if you just looked at the population, that tax burden is about $48 to 135 per person or per resident. Um, the average household in Maine basically has 2.3 people. So that's why we, why we went with that, that particular number as the per resident. So you can see that these programs do have a significant effect on the local community's ability to leverage revenue. And at the municipal level, property tax is the only way in which they have to raise revenue for their mandated and even locally desired um, programs. But the majority of the municipal uh, budgets are expended on mandated activities. So it leaves a very small amount. Um, in terms of solar pressure, uh, municipalities have been pre-inundated along the corridor with applications. And I had conversations with the PUC in uh, areas that are under 20 acres don't seem to hit a number of uh, trigger points for data collection activity um, cohesively. However, MMA has been in conversations uh, with some solar uh, markets to see if we can shift into getting some of our energy from that low, from from solar and uh, one in particular said there were 750 such projects that were in development currently um, which means that there are a number of scrambling planning boards most of them are largely volunteer mostly unpaid and a solar is going to be completely new to them and they're usually in rural areas where they're not looking at this type of large-scale development and because the threshold for uh, site law is 20 acres, many of these um, proposed developments are coming in just under that. 19.95 is the one that's, that's coming into my community. So it means that the, that planning board is trying to make decisions upon how well that suits their area, which is usually largely extends well beyond that 20 acres, but the 20 acres involves things like the vegetation management and the roads and as well as the material that touches the ground. It's kind of like having a volunteer board um, vet a Walmart uh, without any sort of planning assistance, not in terms of its impact, but in terms of the size and the makeup of how difficult and different that, that um, type of development is for them to be able to vet. Um, the smaller sites could potentially, uh, without some sort of comprehensive view or without best practices, which I really loved hearing from uh, Palmer about their approach to that, because these were some of the conversations that we were having as a planning board. How do you, how do you make sure that um, the habitat there is not impacted, is not segmented, because we knew that it was near a couple of areas of uh, special natural interest. But as a planning board, we're not able to actually understand or make those decisions on wildlife. It's not something that we often encounter. It's very um, structural in terms of shoreland zoning and things of that nature that we have to deal with, not necessarily um, you know, impacts upon wildlife for these larger scale projects. Um, and it's also it also became increasingly vital that there was a change, if there was a change in ownership, that that commitment would continue to be a sensitive developer in that area. Um, from what I understand, there's a, at least 227 registered agents currently in Maine. There, there's upwards of 280, I believe, but it's really challenging for a municipal board to know who is the, who is the preferred developer? Who would you want to be the individual or the entity that was developing in that area? Um, I think that pollinator program would would certainly help in that. There's also a lot of concern with the cradle to grave plans um, because there is a significant lack of ability for uh, recycling for these 
for these areas, and I'll show you that on, on the next side slide. However, communities want more solar. They want to be more resilient on that local level. Um, and they're, they're also concerned about the pressures upon available land um, on for, for workforce and, and low income. And this has been mostly from the land purchases that have happened. It's not necessarily agricultural setting in general. It's just that along the Midcoast area, there are swaths of land that are close to the grid that have been purchased at full price by these entities to, for this development. But it certainly does remove um, any sort of land that could be developed for workforce housing, which is also a huge pressure in those communities. Um, let's see. So this area shows you where the, the closest recycling entities are for full solar um, to Maine, and you can see that it's pretty far off. And municipalities have had some traditional historic issues with normal utilities, with things like abandoned poles in the public right away, um, which were allowed to be there at no expense to that utility owner. And it's kind of created this tragedy of the commons response when you're trying to find an entity who's responsible for this. And you often get, because they've been outsourced, shunted to three or four different places. So there's also a concern too about um, the, the particular entities that are developing, having some sort of cohesive communication for issues that crop up on that local level. If there is some sort of storm damage, who is it that you call to have that um, dealt with? And where is the municipal ability to deal with it in the, in the ability or in the event of some sort of emergency? Um, there's been a lot of uncoordinated communication between those parties within the traditional utility um, sphere. So we are concerned that there, there isn't um, necessarily a, a stream for that in this new emerging. Um, so basically, yes, recycling and remediation are top of mind. Um, along with that historic experience, uh, the, the disaster communication piece, and how to, how to determine whether or not a responsible owner is who that developer is. I think that there are a number of ways in which there could be some sort of more robust um, reporting mechanisms that would help communities make those decisions and also make them more sensitive, you know, sensitively. Um, and obviously the, the experience that they've had, uh, there are a number of communities that have had abandoned solar um, arrays that they are left to clean up. So um, making sure that that remediation piece is in there and that the underground infrastructure piece is also removed. So, uh, what is striking in a number of the communities in Southern Maine is how do you incentivize more appropriate development and development in areas where there are already existing issues, you know, maybe stormwater runoff as well. Um, and from what we understand, basically what we've heard that construction costs are far more expensive in these areas, but there are opportunities to look at existing developed areas like malls and parking garages and dark store sites that aren't allowed to have retail that are becoming a huge municipal issue as well. Um, it's challenging to, to bury those materials. It's challenging to retrofit old buildings and additional permitting is often required on contaminated um, and brown fields. And Vermont has a stipulation that um, a quality or a, a determined a qualified uh, conservation organization must be the one that owns and manages open space where there is any solar siting on an open space program. Green roofs and, and solar mitigation in developed communities, I think, is something that um, a lot of the larger communities would be interested in because it meets a couple of their goals as well for stormwater management. Gravel pits and exhausted lands um, would be primary, but those propose um, a lot of construction issues as well. From the municipal level, um, trying to level the playing field because we have a lot of mixed communities. We also have some experience, um, just as an aside, with the mitigation program and uh, in other regulation regulatory areas. And what um, a lot of the Southern Maine communities have experienced is that mitigation funds are great, but it doesn't stop development. 
And they also uh, reach barriers when they're trying to apply to that program for other activities that they seem to be very mitigation in other area focused and not necessarily allow for protection activities. For instance, a community that has an undeveloped parcel of land along a sensitive uh, water body wouldn't be able to use some of the shoreland and, and wetland mitigation funds that have resulted from the development pressures within their community to go into that fund to use those to buy up a swath of land that would protect that water body. Um, that's not an allowable use. So when you're thinking about mitigation funds, I think it is really important to be broad as well as um, a little bit less cumbersome uh, for those communities where that are receiving uh, or generating the majority of those funds because of development pressure where there is some sort of mechanism for them to go back in in some other way or at least to proportionately um, develop that out. We don't want you know, there to be overdevelopment in one area that basically continues to um, restrict development in areas that really do need it. Um, some other, some other uh, from, from the farmland thought process, there are some other considerations that you could have. Um, you could incentivize development in those marginal spaces or unusable spaces, particularly in, in PFOS and PFOA contaminated soils where there's simply not going to be the ability for um, farming to ever occur in those lands again. You could require that any uh, projects be co-located co activities on existing farm, both in production and generation. Um, you could incentivize more structurally challenging built environment focused product, uh, projects you could fully fund um, the municipal reimbursement portion of the current use program to ease that local pain, uh, particularly if you're going to ask for another um, statewide constitutional amendment that would allow the use of, of solar on these agricultural lands. Um, it's really important, I think, to strengthen local planning capacity across the board, but having some solar specific technical assistance, I think would be very beneficial as well as providing the PUC and DEP and ACF with enforcement powers um, and adequate staffing resources to oversee those projects, kind of reducing the burden on local code enforcement um, and shielding owners in the community from planned obsolescence of that technology. It is consistently evolving. A lot of these projects are you know, expected to be 20 or 30 years, but as we know from our phones in our pocket, that is already um, evolutionary and, and finite. Uh, it'll probably be end of life, um, or at least there will be new technologies that have already been developed by the time these particular projects are end of life. Um, closing loopholes that may allow land in one program to roll into another one with no penalties for the purpose of solar farms. There, there is a loophole currently in the tree growth law that allows someone who is in tree growth and that community is receiving funds for to roll into open space um, without a penalty. And that might be something that you want to consider if there's going to be solar siting that, um, that not be an allowable uh, abatement of that penalty for that specific um, reason. Um, you can also roll back on the equipment exemptions for siting in farmland enrolled in current use. So all of these solar um, arrays are 100% um, exempt from their business and equipment tax. However, 50% uh, of that is returned to the community. There's still a loss of 50% of that value to that community. Uh, it's a very localized pain uh, for this exemption of a statewide desire. Um, using soil and land assessments to cite larger and more efficient projects in appropriate places is certainly a way to go rather than having these piecemeal coming just under the 20 acres um, and kind of fragmented, sparse and sprawl-like developments, I think would be good. Um, requiring local government body to be uh, part of that change in use and not just vet the development plan. And there are uh, a number of states that already have that provision built in and I listed them there. 
um, as I talked about, tree growth program and create a list of trusted development partners for any co-location project that is either established by a robust certification program like the shoreland zoning certified uh, contractors or licensing program. But it's, I think it's really important to know who is doing best practices uh, a lot for a lot of these communities, who is a preferred developer and um, what are some of the things that they're thinking of sensitively, especially as um, there are entities that have been in this business for quite some time and probably have some really great best practices that they could be sharing. And you can also revisit the farmland current use program with an eye towards greater accountability and penalties for productivity under solar installations. Currently, uh, the most robust of the land programs is the tree growth program. And it also uh, provides you know, at least some revenue back to those communities. It's, it's currently a low barrier uh, comparatively to the tree growth program for uh, farmland to be enrolled into um, one of these programs. So really thinking sensitively about what is it that this particular program needs to be able to return to that community for the value that it is, that it is taking from that community, particularly if there is going to be some sort of shift within the solar tax assessment. So I stuck some additional reading into the slide and I'll um, spare you the details on that, but there is um, some important background on the use incentives to keep land in productive farm and fishing uh, use that came out of the Land and Water Resources Council. I've included a link to that. All of the issues that, I, that were identified in 2001 are still alive uh, and kicking 21 years later. So um, that might be a good resource to go to. Also the DEP certified contractor. I mean, if, if there was a program to uh, create some um, certification for appropriate solar developers and thoughtful solar developer, uh, developers, I think it might narrow down the 280 some plus entities that are coming into the state um, that are all really hungry for these particular projects. And then a couple of um, long-term effects for the differential treatment between open space and large landowners. Incidentally, most of the uh, community that, or at least anecdotally from Rumford, um, they provided that most of their most um, valuable land is often enrolled in their community is often enrolled in these programs. So automatically there's a, there is a big shift there that would be would exist in rural areas that might not exist in more developed communities. So with that, I'll be happy to take any further questions. Awesome. Um, uh, yeah, so let me just make great. Um, so I can see everyone. George, you go ahead. You've had your hand up for quite some time. Uh, you're on mute. Uh, I still can't hear you. Nope. So uh, I, I had, I oh, no. oh, perfect. There you go. There we go. Um, so uh, one thing, Rebecca, I noticed in your slides, you had our mill rate at 30 and a half. Um, we're at 2260 right now because of a townwide revaluation, which is might potentially have a pretty substantial effect on some of the numbers that you had. Um, but I realized that if you're trying to do 2020 numbers and to do a study there, that's, um, you're kind of stuck with whatever you had for data, but, um, you know, that, that mill rate is really been adjusted significantly, um, as a result of townwide revaluation, um, population also, uh, you're a little low, uh, and I actually struggled to find where, where, where did you get your population figure from? I got both of those numbers from your assessor. From the assessor, okay. Mm -hmm. So assessing, uh, I'll check with them, but they, they got the population number wrong. And I don't know why they got it wrong, um, but they got it wrong. Um, our population right now is of the, even as of 2019, our population estimate with the Census Bureau was 5,744. And as of, um, April 1st of 2020, we're actually at um, 5,858. 
Uh, so those are just some numbers for reference there. Um, you know, and the, the last thing I would say is, you know, we, um, you know, we have had some some developments under 20 acres uh, that use some land parcels that are, you know, directly adjacent to an industrial park, uh, which which we're very happy with. Very very pleased with that development. That's not been a bad thing for us at all. Um, and then actually, Nexamp is doing a 20 acre project um, in town as well. And um, the the other thing that's notable too is that because of the way the infrastructure goes and the farms are following you know, where our three phase infrastructure is. Um, this development is primarily taking place in, in, the, in a, the southeastern corner of the town. So it's very carefully, I would describe it actually as clustered uh, and not, I would, I would actually not describe it as sprawl. And I would, uh, I would actually strongly object to a description of our solar development up here as sprawl. Um, that's, that's, uh, okay. that's not accurate at all. Thank I think, you, George. I think, I think you highlighted something really important, and that is the differential experience. Um, the Midcoast is certainly very different in its experience and where these projects are being cited. And that differential is, um, and lack of tools to be able to assess on that differential is what is a huge municipal pressure currently with all of these projects. And, and I could definitely see that being a problem in the Midcoast where you're going to have um, three phase power is going to be more spread out. Our three phase is absolutely confined to um, the more inhabited sections of the town. Um, we have wild, I mean, quite frankly, wildlands uh, in the northern and western corners of the town where uh, not only is there no three phase uh, up there, there's not gonna be, there's no three phase for miles uh, at a time. And that's one of the reasons why um, we're sort of comfortable with, um, you, you know, I, I can advance um, or encourage solar development here um, comfortably knowing that it's financially infeasible for it to occur in the parts of the town where we do have um, uh, uh, wilderness wilderness areas or um, you know other 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 parts of the town for for that. Thank you, George. Uh, Fortunat. So where I start... thanks, um, Rebecca. Thank you for the presentation. It's really useful to get the municipal perspective. Um, you mentioned in one of your slides sort of existing experience with solar systems abandoned in place by municipalities yeah. in Maine. It's not something I've heard of before. I'm curious if you could say more about, about that, where that is happening and what kind of systems those might be. These are really old systems that were placed on landfills um, as well as, I think, and they were privately owned. Um, the community was end up, end up stuck with these end of life solar panels with really kind of no idea as to what to do with um, they were uh, I'll find that that town for you specifically um, but there are of issues that they came out when we were started having these conversations to say we've got to make sure that decommissioning is part of this because that you know in order to redevelop that land the municipality had to put the cost of the removal of those um, obsolete projects. And those, that was a solar electric project on the landfill in Maine? Yeah, I think it was actually, I think it was a local generation project as well. Got it, okay. okay. Um, I mean, as, um, as Palmer said, I mean, one of the, one of the reasons why um, sort of end of life stuff worries me less than it worries a lot of people is that um, the utility interconnection is such a valuable part of the overall asset and, and such a major constraint on development going forward. Um, that it seems, I think it's, I mean, it's not, it's not a non-issue, but I think it's a much narrower issue than people think because the value of that connection to the grid stays so high over the life and beyond the life of the asset. So yeah, sure, the solar panels will reach the end of their life 30 years from now, um, but there's a very good chance somebody will want that so grid connection good. because it's basically grandfathered indefinitely. So to me, that feels like there's a little bit of a, a sort of built-in mitigator there for risk of abandonment that doesn't exist, for example, with you know a cell phone tower or a you know a single DG wind turbine sitting out in the woods somewhere. That's good to know. <laughs> Great, thank you, Fortunat. Um, Selena, go ahead. Thanks, Rebecca and Palmer. I had a question for Palmer going back to um, the conversation about some of the best practices that your company uses regarding co-location, fencing, pollinator uses, and and other. Um, uh, either design or land management pieces that you have, have used, what do you see? And also Rebecca's interest in, in seeing that 
being furthered in communities, what do you see as the best mechanism to um, make sure that that's ha that happens? Um, there, you know, different companies have different uh, personal investment, and just curious what you see as the best way to um, incentivize that in a, um, or is it just a matter of municipal um, uh, model ordinances or um, uh, uh, best practices or regulations? What what has worked best? Thanks, Selena. Uh, good question. I think um, again, just like um, just like before, there's no single fix here um, that I can point to and say, "Hey, that that made that made sure that that was always put in place time and time uh, again." Um, certainly, you know, if if permitting jurisdictions put language in their ordinances that says you must do this, um, then that's one way to do it, but hard to do when you have so many disparate permitting jurisdictions um, with you know, varying levels of resources as Rebecca highlighted, um, whether everyone's gonna get access to those tools and make sure that they're covering those bases um, as these projects come before them. So um, you know, we, we haven't, I guess, you know, the, the scorecard approach. So in, in Minnesota, um, where you have to do that, I mean, you have to fill out the scorecard you have to attest to those measures being implemented as part of the development of that project. Um, and you have to basically receive a passing grade to get your, your green light to move forward. Um, you know, if you have some sort of documentation that says this project has been approved based on these conditions that this applicant said they would do. And if they don't do it, they're in violation of the approval um, and sort of getting to a little bit of Rebecca's concern about who are we dealing with, not just at the applicant stage, but going forward, um, ensuring that there's documentation in place that says this project must come with these attributes that will serve um, those concerns about habitat creation and so forth. And if it lacks them at any point, it is in violation of its approvals and must you know, cure those defaults um, or risk losing its approval. Um, did you note, uh, Palmer, when you described it, and I just missed it, whether that scorecard applied to projects of any size or, or above a particular threshold? I would have to go double check. Uh, I'm not sure what the bounds of that scorecard, and it varies, you know, Minnesota is, I think, the best example just because it's, it's mandatory, but um, there are probably eight to 10 other states that have some form of a scorecard and okay. aggregated them over time, so I can I can go dig them all up. Um, there's a lot of shared um, inputs across most of them. Um, some of the mid-Atlantic -Atlant states have them. Um, Vermont has one. Uh, Massachusetts has a, it's a very rigorous uh, program through the UMass Clean Energy Extension. Um, I would say it's the most robust uh, in the country, perhaps. Um, and I would also say it, it comes with some uh, acknowledgement of that because the end goal is the developer receives an incentive for implementing that. So if you make it that tough, um, you know, th there needs to be some sort of a way to uh, help the developer, um, you know, maintain that burden. Um, so mm -hmm. there is an incentive in Massachusetts for receiving that certification through that entity. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I mean, we, we have copies of those scorecards um, from all those markets and can certainly share those if that's helpful. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I am conscious of the time. We're over uh, by, by a fair amount right now. So I'd like to suggest that we wrap up this part of the agenda and thank both Rebecca and Palmer for their time. And um, let me just get a, a sense of like thumbs up or, or shaking your head no, that would you find those scorecards from other states helpful information to have um, to possibly build on. You know, I'm constantly trying to figure out how to move this group toward like, you know, product actionable items that come out of this process. Would, is that of interest to any of you? Yeah, okay. Um, well, if that were, if that really is something you're willing to do, 
Palmer, that would be great. Um, and perhaps we could include some or all, depending on the length of it, of what you provide in the next meeting packet. And um, our meetings are monthly and we send a packet out one week in advance. So it would basically give you a couple of weeks to, to pull that together if that would be possible. And we can have an offline conversation about it, but that would be, sort of be the timeline that we're looking at. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, both both uh, to you and to Rebecca, and you're more than welcome to stay on the line if you like. Um, so then let's shift. Um, and um, what we're talking about next is sort of this matrix or tiers concept that uh, was discussed and introduced at the last meeting. And as I mentioned, um, uh, Ethan Winter with American Farmland Trust has offered to uh, present the groups work. Um, there were two subgroup meetings or calls between the last meeting and this one. And um, and feel free to share your screen, uh, Ethan, so that um, the group can see your work. Great. Yeah, it's visible. Are you all seeing that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, I am filling in for Emily Cole. And um, so I don't have any a particular pride of ownership on this, but I, um, Ellen can also elaborate. Uh, and I wanted to circle back to a couple of concepts and also to the, um, the statistics from the Maine Department of Agriculture uh, that were provided in the um, July packet, just for some context. Ethan. Um, Ethan, I'm sorry, and tell me if you were planning on doing this anyway, but I think it would be helpful for the group to know who all has been involved in those subgroup conversations. I have that information if you don't, so whichever you yep. like. Uh, my understanding is um, Emily, Ellen, Jeremy, Matt, and Eliza were uh, on, not necessarily everyone on both calls, but those were the folks who participated in the discussion. And the, the charge was, yeah, if, is there anyone else there? I thought Caitlin as well for one of the conversations. Right. Yep, I missed the last meeting, but okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Caitlin. And then, you know, the group, uh, Caitlin, feel free to dive in here. Uh, two sort of tasks first uh, to develop a list of citing attributes um, that, that make sense, that are um, pulled from available data. Um, and the, the group went with soil classification. We'll talk about that. Um, prime soils, soils of statewide significance and other or marginal, um, kind of in, in one axis and the other axis in our matrix being, uh, is that land an active agricultural production um, as per the, the title 36? And um, the idea here being that we're looking to structure kind of a nuanced approach uh, that differentiates between where you might cite conventional solar um, that's meant for maximum generation versus a dual use solar approach that is specifically designed not to displace agricultural activity uh, that's meant to uh, ensure continued agricultural use of the property along with energy generation. And I wanted to highlight something Palmer mentioned earlier in terms of co-location, um, dual use, and I think this group has discussed this before, uh, really is kind of at a far end of the spectrum in terms of co-location. It involves you know, an intentional design process where uh, agricultural activity is uh, part of the origination of the project. Uh, the design of the uh, racking, the distance between the arrays, uh, again, to optimize uh, agricultural activity uh, along with the solar uh, throughout the lifetime of the project. So um, sometimes these terms, you know, can mean different things to different people and just wanted to clarify uh, dual use here, meaning, you know, typically elevated arrays, uh, spacing that allows for activity, you know, um, agricultural work between and under the panels. Um, and, you know, I think it's fair to say that this is still an active area of emerging science and best practice. 
There's uh, a lot of research that's happening. And I think we talked about this in an earlier call, the potential for research in Maine to really see what works best for the soil types uh, and land in the state. We looked at New Jersey. Um, they're very actively developing their dual use pilot program with the Rutgers uh, agrivoltaics team. Uh, Cornell will be looking at this in New York. Uh, UMass, of course, uh, is very active on this as well. So um, this is an emerging area of expertise for everybody. Um, but I just, again, wanted to clarify, you know, how we're approaching the, the dual use definition relative to co-location, which may have very valid benefits, um, but there is a distinction there in terms of purpose and design and, and outcomes. Um, in terms of the, the matrix here, again, I just wanted to flag a couple of things here from the, um, the main Department of Ag Statistics. Um, you all know this better than me. Um, Maine has about 20.8 uh, million acres of total land area. Uh, of that, according to the NRCS, 14% uh, is categorized as um, crop or pasture land. It doesn't necessarily mean it's active. So I'm just providing some uh, general definitions here. So about 2.9 million acres are categorized by NRCS as pasture or cropland. Um, as well, Maine has about the same proportion of land that's classified as prime land, prime soils, I should say, or soils of statewide significance. There is obviously a lot of overlap between the land that's in crop and pasture and the land that's prime and uh, statewide significant, but they're not necessarily the same. Um, about three quarters of the crops and pasture land are on um, soils of statewide significance or prime based on the statistics that we saw. And um, one thing I'll also uh, add is that I think there, there may be a typo in the material we received. Um, my understanding and looking at this is there's about 730,000 acres of land according to the USGS land cover that is in active crop and pasture land. Um, so that gives you a sense of Kind of how the different acreages break out here. There is certainly a need for a further refinement on the land area and land use uh, accuracy as, as you're going through the matrix here, just to think about, you know, what kind of land types would fall into the different uh, elements of the matrix here, uh, particularly as we're focusing on where it makes sense um, to prioritize dual use versus more conventional project designs. Um, and obviously just to highlight here, um, my understanding from the group, and I'm gonna quickly shift over to Ellen and others to opine on this, is uh, you know, really focusing on incentives uh, for dual use where you have both prime soils and statewide significant soils in active production. Um, as well as where uh, it may be inactive, but still quality soils. There, again, around the research here, um, there may be really great uh, outcomes in terms of using dual use to take good advantage of the prime soils that are there, um, given soil moisture um, and soil water retention characteristics and other, other elements that the soil panels themselves can actually benefit. Um, good soils with. So again, still pretty early in the, in the science on this, but um, pretty promising early uh, work showing that dual use well-designed can actually be uh, quite beneficial to uh, agricultural, you know, specialty crops in particular on the ground. Um, one thing I'll add too, of course, blueberries are a, a famous high value specialty crop for Maine. Um, and I, one thing we wanted to better understand is how those soils are classified. They, they may not actually fall under um, prime or, or statewide significance, um, but obviously it's supporting a high value crop. Um, and we would want to think about dual use in a, in a way that supports uh, blueberries. And there's 
at least one project now that's doing that in Maine, up in Rockland with uh, Blue Wave uh, that I think Caitlin could talk about. Um, maybe I'll pause there and um, let the working group comment on how they came up with the, uh, the terminology here, or if they have any questions. I, I was just gonna add um, to your point, Ethan, about um, wild blueberry barrens. Um, I, I did check with our land staff and in our experience at least, um, though that agricultural land typically falls outside of the prime or statewide important designations. Sometimes they are designated as soils of local importance. Um, but I will say, I mean, we do, as you mentioned, absolutely consider that to be sort of good agricultural soils. And we actually treat that land um, as representing good agricultural soils when we do our sort of purchased easement formulas for figuring out how much to compensate a farmer for protecting that. So I just, mm -hmm. just want to add that. Jeremy or others on the... Could one of you also speak to uh, George, I'm sorry, Fortunat's question in the chat? The difference between other farmland and inactive farmland. Is that... Yeah, my understanding, uh, Jody, is that um, the other farmland is um, a USDA census um, classification. Often that's uh, land around the farm complex or so-called wastelands that are um, part of the farm, but not you know, actively cultivated. So they're not, they're not um, sort of in, in a kind of long-term like, they're not, it's not growing in an early successional field or some, you know, forest or something like that, but it's, it's part of the farm, but it's not in the crop. Great, thank you. Palmer, go ahead. Thanks, uh, thanks Ethan. Um, I just, I guess, uh, to take another stab at the definitions question, actively farmed, um, what, what does that capture? Is that just sort of broad brush, anything that's being actively harvested? I may punt to someone who's more familiar with the, the Title 36 definition there, uh, and I can pull that up. I think it has to do with, you know, how, how recently it's been in production, and I can look into that. Take a look. And do you see um, George's, oh, I'm sorry, you go ahead. Were you going to uh, address that further, Ethan? Uh, no, I, I'm not as well versed as others on the specific definitions in Title 36 there. Okay. Um, so, uh, George. It's linked. To, sorry, I was just going to point out it, there is a link to it at the bottom so people can access the definition. Great. And you see George's question uh, can we get clarification? about whether other farmland is included in current use and meets the definition. Uh, the matrix seems to imply it, but does not, but uh, that it does, but the answer doesn't seem to fully, fully clarify. Do you understand the question? I'm not sure I do. George, do you wanna um, ask it verbally what you're, what you're wondering about? Yeah, sure. So in other farmland, so, um, uh, if something meets the definition of farmland, um, I'm, I have it. I have the statutory definition up here, and the statutory definition basically says there's an annual gross farming income of at least two thousand per year. So I guess maybe that's the concern is that the Title Thirty Six Section Eleven O Two definition, in essence, basically says that something is being actively farmed because there's income implied in that definition. So uh, I'm trying to understand if he's using the definition to imply five acre parcels only that are at a farm or uh, just trying to pick that apart. I think this is a really good matrix, by the way, if, if I'm understanding it correctly. Um, any responses from anybody who's worked on this as within the subgroup? I mean, I think that we sort of struggled with sort of using definitions that are sort of um, codified, right? And so 
Um, that was an area we could use that definition. I agree with you. I think the $2,000 sort of implies there's some agricultural production happening. You're right that that does, definition does include wasteland, um, but I think because it's in that for, you know, current use taxation, it's being used for a slightly different purpose, right, than we would be using here. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things we have to figure out is the sort of um, determinations of, of active versus inactive and, and how we would go about verifying that, I think is something that probably needs to be explored. Um, Fortunate. Um, one quick comment and then a question. Um, I think to Ethan's point it is useful for us to, to first of all agree on and then start using the words co-located and um, dual use you know, to mean what we think they mean. And, and to that end, I think everything in the middle column and the bottom left of the matrix maybe could say encourage co-located development. So it's clear that it is sort of um, along, alongside a farming activity. <clears throat> My question uh, is about the third column in active farmland. Um, if we are saying encourage dual use in those, is the idea that we think that the presence of solar development activity will actually turn, will be enough sort of additional income generators to turn inactive farmland into active? Or what's the mechanism by which that becomes active again? Because it's not dual use if there's nothing happening there, right? Financial um, Fortunate, is the background noise in your office? Because it's hard to hear you. Uh, did, did everybody hear the question that Fortunate posed? It is oh. in my office and I'll move. Okay. Um, uh, could you repeat what you were asking, please? Yeah, my second question was um, about uh, dual use in the inactive column and um, whether, <clears throat> whether that implies that we think that um, doing development on inactive farmland will be enough to make uh, currently inactive agricultural land active or, you know, what's the mechanism by which you do dual use on a piece of land that is not actually farmed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody in the subgroup want to comment on that? You're wondering whether the more appropriate term there would be co-location? Well, I don't know. I mean, is the idea that, that because it's high value land, even if it's inactive, we should do dual use type development there to re retain the possibility that it becomes active again in the future? Or are we actually thinking that by doing solar there, we can somehow drag that back into an active status agriculturally. Was there any discussion of that in the subgroup or any thoughts about that? I think from my perspective, I assume that encouraging dual use on inactive farmland means that there's going to have to be some active agricultural production like immediately upon developing the solar. Uh, project so like it's not retaining the land for future use but it's bringing it into current use not as we're defining it specifically but currently being agriculturally farmed um, by means of the solar farm but I think something important that you said that I want to emphasize is like I think the group um, put this here to say that if it's the kind of the best soil, the best use of that would be to enable it to be farmed if possible using solar as the tool. And anyone feel free to correct me if I'm kind of understanding that intention wrong. Okay, I think that's right. I, I think it's sort of a combination of what you're saying, right? It's sort of, it's both um, preserving the ability to use those soils for agricultural production in the future, but also acknowledging that um, establishing a dual use project could be a great way of doing that, right? Of both sort of bringing that land back into active production while also using it as a place for solar production as well. Um, can I ask something for the group as a whole broader than the subgroup? And I understand this was not your focus, but I'm wondering if this group would find it helpful to have a table that's essentially twice as wide as it is currently that covers 
non-farmland as well? Because I've been hearing, and certainly it was raised at the last meeting, that part of your interest as a group, or at least some of you on this group, is not only to think about how do you appropriately site solar projects on agricultural land and how do you differentiate between the types of agricultural land, but to what extent can you incentivize development on non uh, farmland. And so I, I am wondering if um, the next stage of this would be to add those columns that that deal with non agricultural land. What was there some dis was there any discussion of that in your group? And what's your thought about it? Go ahead, Ellen, and then Selena. Sorry. Yeah, so we actually at the first meeting, we started with the larger list. And then through that discussion, I think, realized that the trickier part was sort of these different um, agricultural designations. And so we wanted to kind of work through that first as a group. Mm -hmm. But I think the intention was always to create, to then bring those other categories in and flesh this out to a greater degree. Got it. Thank you. Selena, go ahead. I think that it makes, you know, I don't have an issue with in one place listing the types of development areas that could be uh, beneficial to focus on and having that in, in some form here. But I do think we have to stay focused on how we laid out the work of this group to start and really focusing on the solar, I'm sorry, on the solar prime, um, prime mm -hmm. agriculture and statewide, sorry, the statewide significance and focus our recommendations and efforts around that. I will flag that there is a, um, as a result of legislation, uh, there will be some effort around planning future solar um, programs uh, that will be a stakeholder effort that will take place um, separate from this group, looking at how to um, shape the future of so solar um, DG programs in Maine. And I think uh, delivering uh, something uh, to that group would be helpful and maybe making a, a note that there are areas outside of agriculture that may make sense to incentivize or to shape your program around, but not specifically including or taking the time now, given that we're, I don't know, halfway through our effort here Got to it. switch gears. Got it. Okay. All right. That's helpful. Um, other questions for the subgroup? I, I think what I'm... Um, I think what it would be helpful is to just get general reactions about the content of this so that we know whether this is a, um, a, a document that you feel is helpful. So, um, you know, you could do thumbs up or if you, you know, a, a thumbs up um, logo or whatever it's called. Um, go ahead, Nick. I was thanks. I was trying to figure out where my thumbs up. I, no, I, I, I found this. I find this uh, clarifying and very useful. Uh, so I, I'll just give my verbal thumbs up. It's. Uh, I think it's a really great document. Thanks. Okay. Anybody? Maybe let me do this backwards. Anybody have major concerns about this? Okay. All right. Well then, um, and I, I guess to to to. Where, where I go with this is, okay, if these are logical ways in which to differentiate uh, types of land and the way in which they're utilized, what do you now do with this? Like, what's, how do you take this to the next step to say, how do you encourage or incentivize dual use on prom soils? What's, what's the next step that would be helpful um, to, 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 you know, turn this into some action. Well, Jody, I'll just, again, as the group is aware, um, where this has first really rolled out in Massachusetts with the six cent adder, um, you know, that's, that's an example of, of how you can incentivize I, I think this group understandably sees that that is a pretty restrictive program. Uh, really doesn't allow for solar on, on farmland uh, other than qualifying dual use. Um, <clears throat> and I think there's good questions as to what that adder ought to be given the range of potential cost inputs. What are you designing for? Um, 
And is it a, for a specific outcome on the ground or is it a certain design? And those aren't necessarily the same thing. Um, I think that's that's part of the, the research that's happening now is, you know, how how important is it for the panels to be six feet versus eight feet versus 10 feet off the ground, uh, depending on what you're growing and where you are, right? Um, and obviously the higher you go um, and the more spacing you have, the higher your costs. And there are valid questions around who pays for that. Uh, if it's, you know, rate payers uh, or, you know, that's potentially eating into margins on projects. Um, New Jersey is going to be actively working on this and would encourage um, members of this group to continue to stay engaged with um, folks there. And we're happy to make any connections if that's helpful. Um, but there, I think that's a bit more of an expansive program there. Um, they really want to see uh, experimentation and uh, the incentives have not been defined yet for how dual use is going to work in New Jersey. Um, so we don't know yet, you know, what just how strong an incentive that's gonna be. Great, um, let me take Ellen and then uh, Nick and then Palmer. I was just wondering if this would be helpful. This is sort of like how I would think about this um, is sort of for these categories where we wanna encourage, you know, we've had some great presentations about um, different tools that different states are using, but if we wanted to sort of like put together a list of what those certain tools might be for these different categories. Um, and also identify what research might be needed to really flesh that out for Maine. Um, because I think that's another big piece of this, right? We may all agree that we wanna you know, provide adders for certain types of projects, but doing that economic analysis of what is enough, right? To be able to support, um, developers in providing in producing those types of projects while also without tipping into sort of an area where then it becomes cost prohibitive um, for ratepayers. So I don't know, I think both like coming up with a list of all the different options that we could be thinking about, but also what the missing information is for some of those options, at least for my perspective might be helpful as the next step. Um, before I take others' uh, thoughts, um, what are, uh, can we find the thumbs up? Can we pretend for a moment that some other symbol is thumbs up if we're not finding it? Is there that symbol? Um, okay. Um, so uh, if, if anyone could, I'm just struggling with the technology here for a moment. If, uh, can you do a, can I see you do thumbs up if you think that that's a good idea? Can you have a, uh, just recap it real quick again, uh, Jody, please, thank you. Yeah, Ellen, I'm gonna ask you to do that. Sure, I, I was just saying, what if we, the next step is we come, up with a list of options, right? So of when we say encourage or incentivize, you know, looking at some of the examples we've seen from other states, what are our available tools, right? And then in creating that list, also identify what's missing information that we would need to really move forward with one of those tools. Just, I just feel like that might be helpful like to have in front of us mm -hmm. instead of all trying to be like, what was it again in Vermont? What was it again in New Jersey? You know, what was Massachusetts? That kind of thing. Are there um, folks on the group that would be willing to work on that? I'm, I'm going to assume that Ellen, you may be willing, but I think always um, it's helpful to frankly have, um, you know, the mix of representation that we have on this group in an ideal world, we would we have a farmer, we'd have a solar developer, we'd have an organization that represents um, agriculture, so, uh, and whatever the other categories are, but um, I think that that makes for a better end product. Um, is there anyone else that might be willing to work on that with Ellen? Certainly volunteering to help Ellen from an AFT perspective. So we've got Ellen, uh, Eliza, um, Ethan, you're saying, or did you just uh, volunteer, Emily? Yep, either or both of us, yes. Um, 
is there a solar developer that may be willing to work on this? Um, and I think this is really important because I, I, I think it's important to get the voice of, no, this is not an incentive. <laughs> this wouldn't work for us. And here's why. Um, yeah, I'm happy to. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. All right, let me leave it at that and then go back up to the questions. And then I wanna make sure we uh, stop for a moment for public comment, um, please. Sorry to interrupt you. I'm just wondering if they could look at both research in terms of the incentives, but also in terms of the um, uh, the agricultural impact and whether we know that it has beneficial um, uh, uh, whether it works from a what it what the component of the of the re ag impacts are and whether we need research around, along that to design the program. Does that make sense to the four of you? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. All right. So I see three hands up, but I'm sorry, I don't know what order they were in. I see uh, Nick and Palmer, and uh, maybe that's all I see right now. So let me take them in that order. Okay, I think that was me. Thanks. I I, I, I think at this point, I'm, I'm just kind of echoing first what I heard from Ethan and now uh, as well from Selena. Um, uh, I'm, I am personally not convinced that you know, raising all racking an incentive that puts racking at eight, 10 feet high is the right way to go, I think, uh, or, or, and uh, establishing incentives for a certain spacing. I think that's what's being suggested that, that there's so much new development that's happening. There's so much um, research that's coming out regularly. There are benefits to a number of different designs. I've seen sites that were um, designed with hay production in mind. So the spacing has been changed, but the height is not. Of course, there's, there's you know, images of panels that are working with the dairy where height is a big deal um, versus grazing sheep, cattle over sheep. Um, I think it's being said again by a bunch of different people here, but um, uh, I, there has to be space for case by case. What types of agriculture are trying to be promoted that would inform thus the designs? Um, and, and, then, and I think that gets very complicated very fast, but it becomes necessary um, if we're talking about incentives. And I, I don't know how it works. Got it. Um, thank you. Palmer, go ahead. Thanks. Um, a lot of great questions coming out of this. Um, I think I have to try to do my best to stitch back to as far back as Fortunat's comment about a sort of, if you build it, will they come question. Um, Selena asking about data behind this and, and Nick's concerns. Um, you know, I, I, I guess you know, I'm curious to know, and I apologize for not having the full backdrop here, but I'm curious to know if this is being seen as sort of a, a, a pilot sort of effort as a broader push to deploy clean energy in the state. Um, I think as everyone knows, Massachusetts has been trying awfully hard, perhaps <laughs> perhaps too hard um, at dual use for a few years now with, with what I would say is very little to show for it in terms of actual projects on the ground. Um, and I know there was a study, um, I could go dig it up, but um, in Massachusetts, uh, there was a study done that showed that yield from a dual use project was I believe 60% of what that field would have produced absent the solar project being there, even as a dual use concept and constructed as such. Um, so I guess, you know, just some, some high level concerns about, uh, and this isn't just for, for agricultural dual use. I mean, when you think about incentives as a driver for the built environment, like rooftops and solar canopies and so forth, um, to provide an incentive is one thing, but um, the market will dictate whether they care anything about that incentive or not, right? Um, there's, there's states that have tried to drive canopy construction. Um, Nextamp has only one, developed one canopy project in their entire lives, and that's not for lack of trying. It's just very hard to do it right, and it's very expensive to do it right. And as you move further north, it just gets harder. Um, so to do a canopy-type project or even a rooftop project in Maine, is tough um, and it requires all of the stakeholders to be on board, most notably the property owners. Um, I think, you know, the uh, shadow store uh, concept was presented earlier and we're seeing a lot of changes afoot in the built environment where, um, you know, due to COVID and due to other drivers, um, things are changing dramatically and 
things that we never thought before would be a Amazon warehouse are now becoming an Amazon warehouse. Um, and they're paying through the roof for those, those assets. And they're certainly not gonna put a solar project on top of it because it's, it's taking their significant investment that's worth multiples over time, uh, what a solar project could do and limiting their ability to redevelop that project, um, that, that building or what have you down the road. So um, no incentive that I've found will ever overcome that. Um, and I think that that could be applicable to dual use as well if you have an incentive, but a lack of agricultural industry members clamoring for sites where they want to grow um, food product, right? And, and so I, I'm, I'm just, I'm looking back at main Audubon's citing tool and I know, you know, that the hit rate for these soil classifications was very high. Um, I don't know that we even have a project that doesn't touch these soils. Um, and at the same time, we don't have any projects as I alluded to before that are in conflict with a farmer growing a high value food crop. Um, these are hay fields. These are fields that aren't producing anything, um, but they're farmland and the prime soils are the soils of statewide importance. Um, but they're sitting there and, and the farmers are throwing their, after you know, this past year, throwing their hands in the air and saying, I'm not doing hay again. Uh, it's just going to get soaked and go bad. So forget it. You guys come do this, deal with this field. I don't want it anymore. So um, just, just some sort of caution from other markets and, and how incentives work or don't work if they aren't um, needs at the property owner level to do what the incentive is trying to accomplish. Got it. New Jersey is um, going to be a ways off from, from doing anything concrete on whatever they're trying to do at the pilot program level. And, and as I said, Massachusetts has tried really hard, um, but it's been really tough. Thank you. Um, Ellen, before I take you, I want to um, find out if there are members of the public that had hoped to speak and take a moment to um, provide that opportunity. Um, and if you could, um, Ethan, can you remind me if um, individuals can raise their hand as um, members of the public? Yes, they can. Okay, great. Yeah, so if any of you would like to do that, I'm seeing nine people, uh, public attendees. And hi, Sarah, we wanted to thank you so much for your service on the committee and um, glad to see you um, in this list of attendees. Um, if not, then we'll circle back to Ellen and, um, but, and if you have a public members have a thought um, in a little bit, feel free to raise your hand then. Go ahead, Ellen. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that um, when I was saying come up with sort of a list of ways of encourage, encouraging or incentivizing, I use the example of an adder, but I mean, I think maybe I shouldn't have, <laughs> but I think, the idea is really just to come up with the range of options that we could be using so that we have them all in one place and we can evaluate whether they might work in Maine or not, right? I mean, because there are certain places where there are limitations on the number of acres of you know prime soils that you can build upon unless you're doing a dual use project, right? So something like that might be more workable or a mitigation fund or what have you. But I just think having all the sort of tools in one place to think through what would work in Maine and also what more what information is really needed to be able to determine um, whether they would work in Maine and if, or if what they could look like in Maine, I think would also be important. Um, but I just wanted to point that out that I don't think we're just coming up with a list of potential adders. Um, Great, thank you. Um, did I, uh, is Patrick still um, uh, with us? Did I um, overlook your interest in uh, participating in this subgroup? Um, and- uh, Yes, I'm still here and I'm certainly willing. Um, if the subgroup doesn't need me, then I'm okay to sit out and wait for the next subgroup as, as well. Um, yeah, yeah. While, while I have um, the floor though, if I could just weigh in before we uh, move along to a break. Um, yeah, I, I like this grid. Thank you to the subcommittee for creating it. I am a little bit concerned, particularly with the inactive farmland that we, we may be a little too limiting. Uh, I think that perhaps we should just encourage uh, inactive farmland to be available for solar development. 
Got it. Okay, thank you. So what I'm going to ask is that um, if the subgroup that has worked on this matrix would be willing to meet once more to take into account the feedback that you heard at this meeting, I think that would be helpful. And if one of you on that group could volunteer to organize that subgroup meeting, I know that um, in the near term, Ethan and Yvette played that role, but we'd really like to push off as much responsibility toward these deliverables onto all of you as possible so that you're really the ones generating the content. So is there anyone who has been on that subgroup that could is willing to reach out to the others on the subgroup to schedule something in the next couple of weeks, see if there are updates that you'd like to make to this document? I can do that. Thank if, you. If you could send me the list of people though, just so I make sure I'm not forgetting anyone. That would sure. Be great. Thank you. And, and then I would ask the same question of this group that would be working on, you know, the range of options that Ellen, you've articulated and um, the individuals who expressed an interest were Ellen, Eliza, Ethan, Winter, or Emily, Caitlin, and Patrick. And the question mark in my mind is uh, possibly George. So whoever is organizing that call, I would include George um, to be safe. Um, anybody willing to do that? Sorry, I thought that's what I volunteered to organize. What am I organizing? The right, you're organ yeah, I think it makes, <laughs> I think it does make more sense for you to organize what I just described. The first thing that I mentioned was re um, reconnecting as an original subgroup about this farmland matrix to um, discuss the feedback that you all got uh, today on this document. Those individuals who were involved in this were Eliza, Matt, Emily, Ellen, Caitlin, and Jeremy. Do you think it's not necessary to circle back to this? Would you like to keep this document in the current form? I think there were a few proposed changes. Maybe it makes sense. Um, I'm happy to send an email around to that group and just kind of go through what was suggested if that's uh, better for people than having another meeting. That would be great. Okay, let's go with that then. And let's go on break and come back at 11.15, okay? Thank you so much.
Selena, um, do you have a commitment immediately following this meeting? Um, I was speaking briefly with Ethan about potentially debriefing um, right after this meeting if the five of us were available, but if not, we stick with the same. I have 30 minutes after the meeting. Okay, I'll check with Nancy. Um, hi, Eliza, Patrick, Ellen, thanks for coming back. Nancy, are you available right after this meeting to debrief at 12 instead? Um, and if not, we'll stick with the same timing that we have on the calendar. No, I can do that. Okay. And Yvette, if you want, okay, great. Um, saw your, I just saw your text, Yvette. So let's plan on that. Um, all right, we're gathering back. Fortunate. Looks like we didn't ever have Matt. Looks like the West prevailed. Okay. Um, George, we've lost. Okay. So if you all could turn to page four in your meeting packet. As I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, this is the updated draft consensus areas document that um, uh, Ethan Tremblay has been kind enough to prepare um, that try has is, is an attempt to capture what we've been hearing as consensus areas and what he did for um, for ease of reading is to put in bold those topics that came up at the last meeting that it appeared uh, there might be some con consensus around. So you're welcome to weigh in on anything on this page. Obviously, it, it continues to be a work in progress, but um, most specifically, uh, you might want to hone in on the um, areas in bold. And really, this is just to get your feedback. So I will open it up to any thoughts at all you have on, on anything on this page with the goal that this would you know, ultimately become the framework for a final report. Sort of a skeleton. Selena, go ahead. While others are thinking, I'll chime in with one thought. And that is on the first one, when we talk about the need for more data, I think it's important to understand what specific types of data we want, how are we going to obtain them, where are they going to live, and how what's the mechanism for collection, collecting the data? Because I think that there are a number of ways that we can go. And I think that getting some clarity of what people find most helpful and palatable to um, get in that area would be helpful to get some input on outside of this meeting. And um, if Sarah had, this was a, a, an issue that Sarah brought up and if Sarah uh, had quick particular thoughts about that that you wanted to offer up, please feel free to raise your hand as well. Other feedback on this? This is a relatively small thing, but um, in the second to last bullet um, about decommissioning requirements, um, uh, at least I personally, or we as a company are not crazy about um, what we did in LD802 and shame on us for not being paid attention and engaged when it was going through the process. I'm not sh I agree with everything in that set, set in that statement up until such as those established by, because I think there's significant room for improvement in um, in what we did in the last session. Do you, do you want to elaborate at all, just so the group understands kind of the essence of concern? Would that be helpful for the group to hear? Um, I'm honestly not prepared to to talk in great detail, but I I think. Um, uh, the way in which we establish the sort of decommissioning assurances should be flexible enough um, 
and and doesn't necessarily need to add cost to projects and we should be careful about adding cost on necessarily a project if if it's not the only way to achieve the outcome we want mm -hmm. Got it. thank you um ellen go ahead um well i hopefully they won't mind <laughs> bringing this up but um sarah and i met with um members of the main geospatial institute i think is their title which is basically um professors throughout the university um, that are sort of doing um, geospatial research um, and, um, and teaching courses related to that. And they were interested to see whether there um, were research needs that would help to inform the work of this group. I don't know if their timeline, it may, would work. I'm not sure they could produce anything in time for our report, um, but they are really interested in this topic. Um, and we're wondering if maybe there were sort of longer term research needs um, that they could be helping with and engaging uh, PhD students and others in. So I did just want to mention that as a potential resource for this group. And perhaps that's something that would be logical to circle back to after this subgroup, this new subgroup that was just um, um, designed uh, develops that list that would include research needs. Seems like that would be the best time to, to circle back to this. Um, I am curious about the group's perspective in light of what they you all heard from Rebecca Graham this morning about this um, uh, do um, the, the tax status clarifying how dual use and or co-located solar development impacts the tax status of farmland enrolled in Maine's farmland current use taxation program. And I think um, uh, Fortunat, you raised the suggestion and, and several others did as well at the last meeting to potentially recommend um, that qualified land remain enroll, remain eligible. Uh, to enroll or remain enrolled in in current use um, even with installation of particular uh, types of solar generation um, specifically dual use do you have different perspectives on that as a group at all based on what you heard today patrick go ahead yeah i'll to say my opinion did not change. I think that we should keep solar eligible for uh, these tax incentive programs. And I, I am one of the municipal voices. So I realize I differ from Rebecca on that, but mm -hmm. I think the solar project should be eligible. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, Ellen, go ahead. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, you're sorry. Sorry. yeah, no, I was, <laughs> I was mixing up your name for a moment. I don't know um, why. No, no worries. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there was a bill in the last legislature that would have sort of um, allowed um, land enrolled in the farmland current use taxation program to continue um, that enrollment if there was a dual use project established on that land. And uh, it basically, I think it, there was not a definition provided of what those requirements would be. It was sort of, uh, you would have to, like the department I think was, would be charged with coming up with what those requirements were to, in order to be remain enrolled in that program. But, um, and I, nothing I heard today, I mean, we were, we testified in support of that bill and nothing I heard today would change that. I mean, I think, especially when you're talking about a dual use project where farming continues to happen on the land. I don't see any reason why it shouldn't continue um, to be able to take advantage of that. Um, okay, that's taxes. helpful. Does anybody feel differently about that? Okay, all right, that's good to know. Um, then what about um, this? There are two others that you haven't discussed yet that are involved. Um, considering how to further advance the adoption of dual use practices, such as through a pilot program. Um, that's one example, but um, is there more that you want to talk about around that right now or to flesh that out in any more detail? Uh, 
So I think it'd be worth specifying that the, the pilot program should be focused on research um, rather than just in addition to any sort of incentive, but focus on research in particular, as we've seen in a number of states. Great. Any other thoughts on that one? Concerns that it's in there? Okay. And um, and um, this last one, um, you know, I've, I've sort of heard two things, some interest in at least, you know, putting a marker somewhere on this uh, interest in this issue and yet not getting uh, pulled too far afield on this topic. So is this, um, how would you like to explore mechanisms without um, going further into this than you think is appropriate as a group? I liked, I think, Selena's suggestion that, um, you know, insofar as we think of ideas that might um, be appropriate incentives there that we sort of formulate a list and toss it over the wall to the working group that will be formed pursuant to LD 936, because that does feel like the more appropriate place to be thinking about it. Um, and, and to Jeremy's point in the chat, um, we should definitely be thinking about those things um, beyond uh, kilowatt hour compensation, which comes you know on the backs of rate payers, but think about um, you know other ways to do that. That are not a, that don't end up being a drag on solar development overall. So this can be done intentionally, deliberately, where you spend some time talking about what those uh, list of possibilities are um, that you then forward over to this other working group, or you don't have intentionality about it and you see what comes up and you make note of them where they come up. Um, and I think uh, it would be helpful to get feedback from all of you as to what tack you wanna take in that regard. Um, yeah, Eliza. Yeah, um, I agree that it, there's a lot of value in maintaining the focus of the group and is, is speaking to someone who is interested in thinking about siting on ag lands, but also siting on in more natural areas. I think, um, maintaining the focus on ag lands, but then recognizing that many of the tools have benefits for siting on other locations. You know, an example I would give um, that is not an adder subtractor example are, you know, simply creating more support for um, municipalities who are looking to site solar. That's something that, you know, we heard from MMA um, is a real need. And I think that that would serve to benefit not only ag lands, but, um, natural areas as well. Um, so kind of always leading with this is how, you know, when that subgroup means, meets, when we're think, listing out tools that could be used to encourage development or encourage dual use, have um, the leading purpose be ag lands, but recognizing that there can be some ancillary benefits to, um, to citing on other uh, resources as well. And just to note those that and how they could be perhaps fleshed out um, in the net energy billing um, process or in, through other mechanisms. Mm -hmm. How does that sound to the rest of the group? Does that make sense? Okay. All right, then uh, we'll leave this sort of next step, if you will, to the new subgroup um, to be identifying those tools and then where appropriate, seeing where they may be of benefit to um, non-ag applications as well. Um, anything that is not on this list that you think should be on it as a result of learnings from today's meeting? Yeah, I'd like to. I think that I have a little confusion on what belongs in this updated consensus area and what might um, result in a more finished um, application or what the more finished product might be. So for instance, you know, two things, because um, I know we're also going to be talking about what could be some possible additions to this consensus area. But I saw, as we were hearing presentations um, this morning, some interest in um, 
exploring more about a mitigation fund and also um, as an example I gave earlier, some interest in thinking about strengthening land use capacity. Are those things that would, if there is indeed some consensus on interest in those areas, is that something that belongs in this consensus area document or in another document yet to be created? Um, feel free to weigh in. I can tell you what my own interpretation of this emerging uh, piece of work is, is that um, if you're simply interested in, in, in getting to the exploration stage of something like a mitigation fund that we pretend, that we look at as we create the agenda for the next month's meeting, we think about how to um, start having a conversation about that and get the pulse of the group once they have more information about it as to whether they think it is a good idea or not. It, once it reaches that point, I think it would deserve to move over into this document. Um, I wasn't quite sure about your second strengthening land use. I wasn't quite sure what that meant. Um, strengthening land use capacity. So having more technical assistance at the state level for municipalities for okay. citing these projects. Yeah, got it. Yeah. So I think those sort of fall into the camp of uh, if there is of interest, if there's an interest uh, by the group as a whole to think about pulling that into a future uh, meeting agendas. Um, and uh, just make sure I'm current on the chat. Anything else that you heard today that you um, think should be pulled into um, a future meeting? Let me put it that way. Um, Caitlin. Um, this wasn't discussed today, but kind of on the topic of potential future discussions, mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure we're not forgetting or perhaps like make the decision to intentionally leave out um, kind of the construction conversation. I know we're talking a lot about like what siting ends up being and what the impacts end up being, but a lot of impact from solar can be mitigated during construction specifically. And I know at the very beginning, we kind of talked about what are best practices or, you know, guidance that either like solar developers have or certain municipalities have. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that's either a topic that we intentionally are not interested in discussing in the scope of this group, or if we do wanna discuss it, then it's for future discussion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, what's everybody's reaction about that? Do you want to know more about that? And thank you, Caitlin, for, for raising that. And one of our originating buckets was sort of the, the best management practice and guidelines bucket, um, knowing that those type of resources are simply that, they're not necessarily um, required. That being said, I think it would be useful perhaps if, if you're aware of resource documents or your own company is utilizing them and, and would be willing to share them. The department put together a year ago best management practices that that nibbles around the edges relative to installation and construction um, based on our technical expertise at that time. Um, so that is certainly a resource, but we're willing to enhance that going forward um, and improve upon it if that's one potential solution as well. Would it be helpful to seek feedback from this group in writing between now and the next meeting on anybody who feels like they have that expertise, most likely the solar developers, but potentially others on um, possible additions or um, 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 refinements to that uh, report? With that, what are, you, what are you thinking, Caitlin, in terms of the most productive way of getting at that? I was kind of just wondering if it's in the interest of this group. I mean, I'm happy to participate in that kind of knowledge gathering, but if it's outside of the scope of this, I'm not trying to steer us off the uh, productivity that we've gotten so far. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just need to get some reaction from the group in terms of where this falls in terms of interest. I, I think of it as fairly high value in that it's one of the places where, you know, you can do the research and collect the best practices once, and then all the local planning authorities can benefit from it. Um, and, you know, one of the challenges we have, of course, is that um, 
you know, towns are small and planning boards are, you know, inexperienced or unsophisticated. And so the more we can put sort of simple to use tools in their hands, I think that, that everybody benefits from that. Mm -hmm. And uh, would the best way to get at that be um, written feedback? Um, I'm just wondering if it may not be necessary to have a group conversation about this. What's your thought? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's the kind of thing, especially since there is sort of an existing document from um, uh, Nancy's organization that sort of asynchronous um, feedback works just fine for them. Okay, all right, let's go with that then. Um, anything else that you know that you feel is missing uh, in where we're at so far on this, uh, in this document? Okay. Oh, please. Um, Nick, did you have something? Yeah, I, thanks. I, I'm sorry, I don't have a more formulated thought here. But um, a point that, that has come up a number of times during a number of our previous calls is the, uh, inevitably from um, some of the developers in, in our group is, is, is the idea that we're going to need some large pieces of, of landscape, some large acreage um, to uh, hit the generation that the state requires, um, that, uh, that it's not going to be small uh, sites that get us there alone, or it's not going to be small sites, brownfield, industrial alone. There needs to be some large pieces of land peppered in there as well. Um, I, I know everybody else is aware of that. It's, 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 it's on my mind, yet we have no sense for the volume of projects in the queue, um, the, what's being suggested and deliberated in some municipalities. What, which, what are the large projects? What are the small projects? Um, there's, there's talk about um, just the highest value of our lands and our soils. I, I'm not disagreeing with any of that um, and incentivizing, directing where development goes and what that development might, might look like. Um, but we're not talking about that scale. And I think that becomes a factor too in how we incentivize and um, direct. Um, I think that's, that scale has to be a factor as well. Um, uh, and I just wanted to make a point of bringing that up that there, there has to be a point of differentiation um, um, at some point in, in, in how we are incentivizing and treating um, some of the large scale projects too. Um, and I'm struggling with this and I'm sorry, it's not completely refined, um, but I wanted to try to bring it back because it has been brought up a number of times scale of projects um, uh -huh. to help uh -huh. the state achieve its goals. So. I, I mean, one thought about that, and I, I don't mean to put you know, all problems uh, and the creation of all solutions into this, onto this new subgroup, but I do think that as that group begins to identify the tools, sort of list the tools that other states have used, some approaches, that are germane to large uh, scale projects may, may emerge. Um, I think it's worth seeing whether that's the case. And if not, um, revisiting this issue at the next meeting if it feels insufficient. Um, but I think that's one path forward. Totally open to other ideas. Well, um, let me recap where I think we're at in terms of um, actions and possible uh, agenda items uh, that are, are emerging so far. And of course, right after this meeting, um, Nancy, Selena, Ethan, Yvette, and Yvette and I will have a debrief call where we generally um, try to design the next agenda based on what we hear to be your interests. Um, but we've got a couple of things going on. One is this new subgroup that's going to be um, developing a list of um, a range of, of options and research uh, needs. Um, 
pulling in learnings from other states um, on, on various types of incentives. Um, we will presumably have some written materials to provide back to you in the next meeting packet um, from what this group has generated and likely have a discussion about that. Um, I think revisiting this um, draft farmland matrix with any changes that may emerge between now and the next meeting would be important to do as well. There was an interest that you all expressed in getting, uh, seeing the um, scorecards from other states. And so I will um, work on getting that from Palmer, provide that in the meeting materials and presumably there would be a discussion about that. Um, and that, and, um, you know, we're always going to have this emerging consensus areas document on the agenda. Um, that's what's occurring to me so far. What about the rest of you? Other things that you were really hoping um, would be um, talked about? Ellen. Well, are we hoping then that, um, I think there was just based on the questions and then Eliza's comment, um, there was a lot of interest in sort of understanding more how mitigation funds have operated in other states. So I don't know if we were thinking we would try and tackle that next meeting or not. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I just forgot about that. That seems like it would be logical as well. And then the other thing I was wondering if, um, I know in that July packet and Ethan referenced that, you know, there were some statistics, um, <clears throat> but I was wondering, because I think both some of our land staff is familiar with it. I know Sarah has done a lot of research around it, but just when we're talking about, I just think maybe for the group, it would be helpful to put some more specific acreage amounts or more specific percentages of when we're talking about like how, because I know we have 14%, but that's prime and soils of statewide importance, just like figuring out where we can break it down a little bit, because I think, um, I don't know, sometimes those categories can seem larger than I think they actually are um, on the ground. And so I'm just wondering if there's a way um, to get a little bit more specific data, because I think exists out there, or at least more specific estimates exist out there. Why don't I suggest that um, there be an offline conversation with you about that? Um, I know Yvette has been the primary person who's been pulling that information, trying to figure out the best way to, to share it back with you that's actually useful. And so it may make sense for the two of you to have a conversation and if you have additional information to provide to her that you think would be helpful to, to do that. Um, so I'm thinking that we have um, the, the bulk of um, the agenda for the next meeting, but obviously other issues will likely come up um, with the planning group. Um, so I'm thinking other than uh, checking in with the public to see if you have any um, other interests in raising issues with the group that we may be at, uh, we may be done. Um, so our next meeting is on Thursday, September 23rd. Um, anything I've forgotten of the chairs, Nancy, Selena? And do you have your hand up anew, Ellen, or is that an old hand up? Okay. <laughs> um, just, anything? Thanks, Jody. I just note that we have four meetings left. The last couple will probably be fine tuning. So if people have topics that they want to delve into that haven't been raised the next meeting or two as a kind of the, I think we should come up with fine tuning recommendations as we get towards the end of our um, time together. So if other people have other ideas they want to flag between now and the next meeting, feel free to email any of us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that point, Selena. Um, good then I think we're all set. Um, thank you all so much for, for um, the time and, um, and Ellen's following up with the group and uh, Caitlin's following up by email with the other group. And I think, I think we're good. 
Right. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. And Ethan and Yvette, if you could stay on. <laughs>